I think the biggest news of this past week is that the FDA and the CDC approved boosters for children five to 11. Um, that's sort of been all over the, the news headlines. Um, and so I think that that's the biggest news. You know, other news is that COVID cases in general are going up, unfortunately, across the country. I think they're going up by about 53%. Um, so, you know, that's pretty high and may affect uh, sort of what you decide you want to do with your plans over Memorial Day weekend uh, or, you know, anything coming up for you. Uh, but does anybody have any questions in particular? So that's a good question. How long do boosters last? And I don't think anybody knows that exact answer. However, I will say some of the studies that are coming out say about six months. Um, and so, you know, if you're about six months from your last booster, you may want to consider getting a second booster. Uh, however, if you're under the age of 50 and you're not immunocompromised, you know, my own opinion would be probably wait till the fall when the numbers really start to, to climb up when you're looking for that next booster. Uh, or getting, you can always get your antibody levels checked too to see sort of where you're at. Any progress update on fall booster shots? Other than the vaccines that are out right now, no. Um, an 11 year old who had her second dose in November um, or wait till late summer. You know, I would wait if your 11 year old is, you know, and this is not based on evidence because there isn't evidence. Um, but what I would say is that if your 11 year old is fairly healthy, not immunocompromised, and they had it in November, you know, they're just probably at that six month mark or just uh, went by. So maybe waiting till they're gonna go back to school would be a better option, unless you're, they have a lot of health concerns. You know, that's a completely different story. Uh, Kaiser saying five months. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Um, any decrease in long COVID cases? Not, not really, no. I actually did see um, a study recently that said that out of everybody with long COVID at the year mark, only 15% had resolution in symptoms. And I found that so sad and devastating uh, that only 15% are really, you know, getting better, I guess. Um, Chinese herbs recommended for long COVID. Uh, so this is a question I get a lot. I'm actually not a Chinese herbalist. Uh, however, you know, with Chinese herbs, it's all about the pattern and for the individual. So really that would be something if you are interested in Chinese herbs, finding one. Um, I think Tiffany at the Center for Integrative Medicine does, herb, does herbal medicine and she would have to meet with you and decide what the pattern is to, for the particular herb. Um, how long will one's immunity last after having COVID? Nobody knows, maybe three months, maybe more. Uh, perimenopause. So um, I have heard some people have, you know, some changes in their menstrual cycle following the vaccine or following getting COVID. I think that is pretty common that it can skew your hormones a little bit. There isn't a study necessarily other than that the vaccine, I believe, can cause a change in your menstrual cycle. Um, cycles have been delayed, yeah. Although some long COVID symptoms, I can say mimic perimenopause, so be careful about that. Uh, I do know quite a bit of people who have been sort of uh, wrongly diagnosed with perimenopause and it really was long COVID symptoms. Uh, the booster is not different than the original at this time. Um, although there are, you know, they are thinking that Pfizer is going to come out with a booster soon that's Omicron specific. Yeah, so I mean, that's really an individual decision on whether you want to um, boost before you travel. Sure. And I think it depends on a lot of factors. I think it depends on your age, your risk level. Uh, you know, if you, you have a lot of medical conditions and you're at that high risk mark, maybe before you travel, you definitely uh, get boosted. I think what I'm going to do personally, I have a conference coming up in Indianapolis this weekend and into Monday. I'm just on the plane, even though you don't have to wear a mask, I'm gonna wear an N95 mask and a mask over that uh, just to be safe. 
So, and I think the CDC, yeah, I think this is the guidance that uh, Janet's talking about. They're, they're recommending that you test before and after you travel as well. Um, yeah, cycles have been delayed. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty common um, that cycles have changed after the vaccine. Mm. I have heard that quite a bit. But yeah, so, you know, it's still, of course, like new evidence is coming out and new research is coming every day. Um, and as it sort of comes up, we'll of course talk about it, either myself or Misha. Uh, but, you know, right now, I think those are the biggest things is that the boosters approved and, uh, you know, CDC traveling guidelines about testing yourself to keep yourself and others safe. Ashley, as an acupuncturist, is there anything um, about, do we know anything about acupuncture and COVID yet? Not yet. I've seen some case studies uh, published about acupuncture and long COVID specifically. Um, and there has been a lot of success. And a lot of the webinars that I'm on about some of the bigger research studies, um, like Recover, for instance, and I think um, you Connor is doing one too. talk a lot about how acupuncture really helps with long COVID, uh, but nothing like in terms of prevention. I haven't seen anything in terms of prevention mm -hmm. uh, or acute COVID. I think that just speaks to the fact that acupuncturists at this time are not seeing acutely sick, you know, patients, of course, because they don't have the personal protective equipment and the setup, you know, the ventilation for something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. More questions. How long is COVID, long COVID being defined now? So it depends on the definition. Some say six weeks, some say 12 weeks. Um, can it cause chronic elevated blood pressure? Yeah, sure. I think it can cause most things. It affects most organ systems in the body. Uh, and I've seen some of that. Um, especially if they never tested positive. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, especially when testing in the beginning was really rare and hard to get, there probably are a lot of people who had COVID and just don't have, didn't know for sure if they had it or weren't able to test. Uh, so yeah, that's a definitely a good point to bring up is how would they know? Um, after recently having COVID, when would the second, second booster be recommended? So if you're going by strict CDC guidelines, they would say as long as you didn't take monoclonal antibodies or anything like that, you can get it right away after you feel better and you're fever free for 24 hours, right? Uh, but I would say probably give yourself, you know, three, three to six months. Percentage of patient, long COVID patients that are unable to work. You know, I don't know that percentage offhand. Uh, I don't know if they've actually been able to quantify that as of yet. Uh, but hopefully with the fact that long COVID is considered a disability by social security standards, I'm hoping that data will kind of follow showing how many people are at least on social security that might give us an idea of how many people are out of work because of long COVID. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks. Oh, one more question and that's it, everybody. <laughs> After having non-COVID vaccinations. So most of them, honestly, they say you could get them at the same time. You know, there are people getting the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine the same day. Do I recommend that? No, <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Uh, that's a big hit for your system. I, I try to separate it a little bit if you can, but there, there is no direction saying that it's Oh, except shingles vaccine, maybe that's the case, but other ones I know for sure are not affected. All right, well, great. There's your COVID Q&A. <laughs> Those are some great questions, everyone. Yeah. All right, now uh, let's turn things over to Jennifer Leon. And uh, welcome. Hi, hi everybody. It's nice to join you and um, thank you, Ashley, for that summary. Um, I've watched some of the old ones, so I see that this is an ongoing conversation. It's very helpful. Um, and so I am going to shift gears here, um, no, no uh, natural way to do that, <laughs> to <laughs> explaining the nutrition facts label. And so the nutrition facts label is on every product in the grocery store that's in some way processed um, or packaged. 
So you won't find it on things like, you know, an apple or a banana, but you will see it on a package of pretzels or soup or cereal. Um, and it's meant to give an accurate understanding of what the nutrition um, facts are in that product. Nutrition facts labels have changed over the years. As science is updated, what we understand about food and nutrition and changes, the nutrition facts label follows that. In addition, we also learn what people in the United States are more deficient in. Maybe um, they change the nutrition facts label to show um, to show um, nutrients that we should have more of, nutrients that we should have less of. So they do change them over, over time to try to better reflect what the population needs to be able to support its health. So I'm going to show you uh, the Nutrition Facts label. Hold on a sec. And here we go. All right. So here you can see, uh, can I get a high five if uh, you see the label? Okay, great. All right, so here I, I posted a picture of the old label and the new label. So the new label was supposed to come out with a big campaign in 2020. Um, so it kind of petered itself into the, into the um, food supply um, a little slower than was expected. Um, but by now, all of your products that have labels should have the new label for sure. So I'm just gonna show some differences between the old label and new, new label. And then we're gonna talk through what, what does this say? Like, what does all this mean? And what does that mean for people when they're trying to pick products that are healthy for them? So first of all, what was changed is that the information that says how much is in a serving size, how many serving sizes are there in the container and how many calories are in that serving size has been vastly changed, right? And much easier to see that a serving of this product has 230 calories, there are eight servings in this container, right? So imagine a package of cookies, right? You can easily tell that this package of cookies was not meant to be consumed in a single sitting, right? It's meant to have about eight servings per container. A serving is an actual official term. It's different from a portion, right? A portion is what a person chooses to eat at any given time. It's their portion of food. There's no science behind it. A serving, according to this nutrition facts label, is an exact amount. So every group of pretzels is going to be the same serving size. It's going to be two thirds of a cup and so on and so on for every product. They've standardized it so that people can understand what they're looking at. So this is, this is saying there's eight servings per container. That's the, one of the big things that was shifted. In addition, they changed some of the nutrients that they're highlighting to better reflect what Americans need more of. Um, and they added something called the diet, the uh, added sugars has been added and they, um, and they just made it a little bit easier to read, a lot bigger in this section. So I'm going to go through, now you see the difference between the old and the new. A lot of this information was taken out. Um, and so the important, the information they deem important was made a lot bigger and hopefully easier to read. Um, so what is this all saying to you? So this nutrition facts label is meant to show that um, the serving size is two thirds of a cup, but that doesn't mean it's a recommendation. It's just a standard number, like an inch or a cup or a tablespoon. It doesn't mean that's how much of it you should eat. Um, it's also sometimes is not reflective of what people eat, right? If you're sitting down with a pint of Ben and Jerry's, in the past, that pint of Ben and Jerry's may have been two or three servings. I think they've recently changed it so that the pint is actually listed as a serving people sit down and eat the whole pint. But for a bigger container of something, the serving size may not reflect what people actually eat. So it's very important if you're trying to track these things to know how much is in the serving that you are eating. Is it a cup, a half a cup? How much is that? One time, I always recommend people, if there's something you're trying to track, one time measure that thing, put it in a, in a tablespoon or in a cup, whatever the serving size is, and then put it in that bowl or plate or cup or whatever it is you eat it in and look at it. You'll know for the next time how much is a serving, right? I, I try to make things very practical. So if you're trying to track something, you wanna know how much is in your thing, that's a good way to do it. Once you eyeball it the first time in your favorite thing that you use, you'll be able to track that. So that's what, that's what the serving size means. So if you're eating two thirds of a cup of something, you're gonna get 230 calories, you're gonna get 160 milligrams of sodium and so on. If you're having two servings of that, if you're having a cup and a third, you're gonna have 460 calories. 
320 milligrams of sodium and so on, right? That's how you read that. Next after that is important to notice the, the parts of this nutrition label you think of you wanna have less than and the parts that you wanna have at least or more than. So the general less than things, you wanna try to have generally less fat, less cholesterol, sort of, less sodium, and the carbohydrates is sort of in the middle there. Um, you wanna have at least, and it's supporting the fiber, vitamin D, calcium, iron, potassium. That's in general. Everybody has their own nutritional requirements and needs and things they need to limit. So this is all very general. So how do you look at these things that you're supposed to supposedly limit, right? So total fat, it's kind of just a number up there. Like how do you even deal with that? So you might wanna break that down to saturated fat and trans fat. So first of all, trans fat, you may remember there was a lot of news about trans fat some years ago. A lot of manufacturers have tried to pull out the trans fat in their labels, which is great, but also sometimes misleading because they have figured out how to get just little enough so that the label can say zero. But if you're eating more than one serving of it, you're actually getting a bunch of trans fats. What does that mean? If in the, in the ingredients label, it says partially hydrogenated vegetable shortening, if that is in your ingredients label, but your trans fat says zero, that means they've included just enough so that they could still say zero, but it's in there. So if that's something you're going to eat a lot of, like nacho chips or something like that, or some sort of pie crust, you're ending up getting a good amount of trans fats. Trans fats are like the boogeyman of fats. They raise your bad cholesterol and lower your good. You want to take them out of your diet at all costs. So just take note. You should be reading the ingredients to confirm that there's no trans fat in whatever it is that you're eating. Saturated fat, um, the American Heart Association recommends to have five to 6% of your daily calories from saturated fat. So if you have a 2000 calorie general diet plan, that's gonna be about um, 13 grams of saturated fat, about to look at it this way. Um, it's about 2000 calories would get you to be about 120 calories, which is about 13 grams. Um, if you are concerned about your um, LDL, your HDL, you know, these are numbers you have to pay attention to. This is a number you wanna have less than, right? Okay, I kind of skipped calories because I kind of feel like there's a lot out there about calories in, calories out. There's a lot of different feelings about should I limit calories? Should I not limit calories? So right now I really just want to focus on nutrients. Um, I think a discussion of calories is interesting, um, but too broad for today. So note the calories, see where they fit into your world, but a calorie is not a calorie is not a calorie, right? We're looking for culinary medicine program. We talk about eating quality calories. Um, we don't talk a whole lot about counting calories, but it is relevant to an extent. It is a tool. It is not the only tool. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about calories. So moving on to sodium. A um, lot out there about sodium. In America, the recommendation is to limit your sodium to 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day for the average person. If you are making a lot of your own food and using a lot of your own herbs and your own blended spices and um, your own, you know, vinegars and olive oil or um, spices that you have that you haven't bought a blend, likely your sodium's able, you have an easier time keeping your sodium level under 2,300 milligrams. If you are using a lot of bottled sauces, if you get a lot of packaged foods, if you eat a lot out at restaurants or um, even fast casual restaurants, it's possible your sodium is getting higher and higher and higher. So it's a lot easier to control this sodium when you are in control of the amount of salt you put in your food. If you are buying a packaged food and letting them put the sodium in, you want to watch this like a hawk, right? General for people, 2,300 milligrams. If you have high blood pressure, your doctor may have recommended 2,000 milligrams. They may have even recommended 1,800. I've seen people with a recommendation as low as 1,500. Very hard to follow. You have to be very, very strict. Numbers you should know if you are advised in some way, if you have high blood pressure, um, your doctor or cardiologist hopefully has given you a number that you're looking for. Okay, so moving on to carbohydrates. 
what we're looking for here, I want to talk about fiber and added sugars. And this is one of the biggest things that changed in the Nutrition Facts label. The old label does not say how many added sugars are in here. So there's a lot of question like, hey, I'm supposed to have more fruit. What if I have juice? What if I have whole fruit? What if I have this product that has all these added sugars? What's the difference, right? If you are eating an apple or a banana or an orange, and yes, it has natural sugars in it. It also has all the fiber of that product. So it is less likely that your blood sugar would spike up after eating that product because you're eating it with all the fiber. If you are having something like juice or if you're having this product that has 10 grams of added sugars, that's just sugar that's been added. It is not added with extra fiber unless for some reason they manufactured it that way, but it's not that it's just added sugar. That is the sugar that will more likely spike your blood sugar. So if you are trying to um, keep within a recommendation, how many added sugars am I supposed to get? For women, it is um, 24 grams per day. And for men, it's 36 grams per day. So you're trying to limit to no more than 24 grams for women, 36 grams for men per day. Does that mean you could have less? Yes, of course. Added sugars are not good for us. They're not good for us no matter what. You don't need to get added sugars in your day. Um, is it okay to have things in moderation? Yes, of course. So just know what moderation is. And if this is something that is important for your health, pay extra special attention to it. Fiber, very, very important. Fiber helps us keep our bowels moving. It could help us absorb less of the, the cholesterol and saturated fat that will raise our cholesterol, our overall serum cholesterol. Um, it helps keep blood sugar down. Fiber is very important. If you're eating a meal, you're aiming for somewhere around 10 grams per your meal. If you're having a snack, you're aiming for something like five grams. Is that 100% true like five? No, or whatever you consider to be 100% true. Sorry about that, didn't mean to. Anyway, just a phrase. Um, but uh, you're aiming for five to 10 grams of fiber for snacks and meals to be able to get to a number through, throughout your day um, so this is a good number to pay attention to. Protein, not going to go too far into that. Um, people have different beliefs in how much protein they need. That's, again, another discussion for another day. These down here are the numbers you're trying to get more than, right, at least or more than. So these are good numbers to know if you're tracking actual amounts. Some people are tracking vitamin D and calcium. If you are, these are good numbers to look at. These percentages are based on how much of this nutrient is in a 2000 calorie diet. So if you are trying to figure out what does that mean for you, and you're looking at these numbers, these numbers, these percentages, if it's greater than 20%, it's a product that has kind of a lot of that thing, right? If you're looking at these numbers and you want it to be less, right? If you're looking for it to be less, you want the number to be about 5%. If it's like a five, if it's this number and you're like, hmm, a good product would have maybe 5% of their, uh, of the daily added value, the daily value for sugars, then that's a good product for me, right? So those are just guidelines to help you figure out what are you looking at? All right. So that was a, a quick and dirty on the nutrition facts label. I can go on and on and on about a lot of these nutrients, but I think those are the major headlines. I'm wondering if anybody has any questions and I'm going to stop sharing if I can. At least I'll get to the, there we go, stop share. Okay. Um, and I could look at the chat and see if there's any questions. I don't see any yet. Does anyone want to unmute themselves to ask a question? You can if you want to. Hi, this is Jada. Um, how many grams is in a teaspoon? Uh, it's about four. I'm sorry? Four, I believe. Yeah, four, four to five. It can be up to seven, depending on the size of a teaspoon. Okay. The so standard uh, teaspoon, yeah, it would be about four. So is that like a third of a teaspoon or a fourth or a half of a teaspoon? Um, well, I would say it's four grams in a teaspoon. 
Okay, I just don't know how to measure it. That's what I'm really saying. So if I had a teaspoon, I don't know how many grams, you know, if I had a teaspoon, I wouldn't know how many grams is on that teaspoon. So um, a, a standard measure teaspoon, like, you know, that used for baking, mm -hmm. that would be four grams if okay. you filled it. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. The whole about. Teaspoon. About. Okay. We're gonna... About the whole teaspoon. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So Jennifer, I'm just, because I'm in the other side of the world, I'm just curious. And I mentioned about how it doesn't specify the ingredients, but Lee was saying that there's a separate label or a, a label that goes underneath that nutrition facts label, which lists all the ingredients. Oh, yes. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't. Oh, yes, it does. So the nutrition facts label, the part I just showed you is just that data. And then the ingredients are listed underneath it. Um, and the ingredients are listed in terms of what is the most in it. That's the first one. So are there any ingredients that um, they are not obliged to list? I, I see somebody mentioned about MSG and um, I know too, they use, a, I don't know what they do in the States, but here in New Zealand, um, we use numbers. So like ascorbic acid is 100. Um, do they have that sort of system in the US as well? Uh, 100 in terms of? That's, that's the code for ascorbic acid. So um, if you see... Um, ingredients um, one zero zero um, that is ascorbic acid. Got it. No, it doesn't. We don't have that. Yeah, I'm not sure if there are. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. I feel like I might be missing something. But no, matter. you're not. Oh. There, there oh. have there been uh, additions to supplement the wonderful um, talk you just gave us. Okay, everyone, it's 2.31, and um, I am just going to say thank you so much for being here, Jennifer. Appreciate it. And um, why don't you tell people a little, little bit about the thank Community you. Culinary Medicine Program? Yes, thank you so much. So I just actually put into the link, um, the, uh, a link to, uh, into the chat, so the link to our community classes, and I'm going to show you Oops, the website in just a second. I'm gonna pull this up and talk it through as I show so you really quick. these classes are free? Yes, um, here we go. So um, I teach these culinary medicine cooking classes. These are free classes that are available to the community. They are hands-on cooking classes where we teach nutrition concepts and then literally teach how to apply them to your food. It's based on the Mediterranean diet. So we teach what the Mediterranean diet principles are but it doesn't mean you have to cook food from like Italy and Greece and Spain. It just means that those, um, those elements were shown to decrease risk for a lot of illness and it shown to improve health in lots of people. So we teach based on the Mediterranean diet. I teach from my kitchen. Um, the other instructors teach from their kitchen. Our participants are in their own kitchen and they're cooking using their own stuff and they use the recipes that we provide, but they can change them based on what they have. So if we're calling for this vegetable and you've got that vegetable, great, we'll talk to you about how you could substitute that. Um, and we go step by step by step for seven weeks. It's about two and a half hours. We have a really good time and we teach a nutrition concept. And then we cook food along with that concept. At the end, participants leave with a whole slew of recipes that work really well for them. Um, they're delicious. And it's really fun. We have a great time. And the whole point is just to teach people how to um, have healthier lives and use nutrition to help them. So this website where I put the um, link, it shows you what the program is. It shows you our schedule of classes. So we have a class that started last night. We, they start on a rolling basis. So we have one that's starting in June and then we have them starting in the fall. You can, um, to get more information and stay on my um, radar, you can fill out this interest form. And when you click submit, it goes to me. Um, and I will send you a note saying, hey, which class do you wanna participate in? And if you say, I'm not sure yet, but just keep me in the loop, I'll keep you in the loop. Or if you're ready to register for a class for yourself or with your friends, I'm happy to welcome you. This is available for people in the DC area, right? So if you're somewhere in the DMV, that's who is eligible. If you do not live in the DMV and you're interested, just let me know and I could find out if there is a similar program where you live. 
And I can vouch for the program because I did the beginning class, beginners class, and I just finished the intermediate class, and I really enjoyed it. Learned a lot um, and had a really good time with uh, my fellow students and the teachers. Thank you. We had a great time with you, Janet. I was so glad you were part of it. Um, we love it and the students love it and it's really educational and fun. So give it a try if this is uh, in, your, in your interest. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Okay, Ashley. Thank you. Jennifer, that was great. I learned a lot. Uh, and I hope I can take some of your classes too, so I can better myself. <laughs> oh, I'd love to welcome you in. Come take my a class. Skills. <laughs> well, it's so good to be back with you guys. Um, I'm happy to be back. And you know, if you see me, we're probably going to do some acupressure in Qigong, right? Uh, and talk a little bit about five element acupuncture. So I will share my screen just for a couple of minutes to give you a little bit of background information so that the Qigong and the acupressure is meaningful and has sort of a foundation. So let me do that. Great. So we're gonna talk about the summer, which probably feels silly to many because we're still in May, right? But when you're looking outside and it's this hot outside uh, and the days are getting longer in Chinese medicine, that energetic change is what we consider summer. So it doesn't have to be necessarily that day in June that uh, we decide is, is the start of summer. So the summer is associated with the fire element. I know if any of you were here last time, you heard about the spring, which was associated with wood. Um, Summer is associated with fire, which I like this graph graphic because you can kind of see where it is in the cycle, right? It's right at the top. Um, and what's interesting about fire element is that it has four officials associated with it. Whereas all the other ones, um, you know, as you may remember, we talked about the spring and liver and gallbladder, and that's just two. All the other ones have two officials. Uh, and summer and fire is special. It gets to have four. Um, and other things that the summer is associated with and the fire elements associated with, which I think won't be a surprise, is joy, laughter, um, and the four uh, officials are the heart, the small intestine, the pericardium, and the triple heater, which is sort of unique, the triple heater to Chinese medicine. There really isn't uh, an equivalent in Western medicine. So if we go to the next slide, I'll talk to a little bit about what these uh, organ systems officials do in Chinese medicine. And so the heart shouldn't be a surprise, right? Because it governs blood, blood vessels, circulation. That's kind of what we know it does in Western medicine anyways. So we're familiar with that already. Uh, but also in Eastern medicine, it's considered the emperor. It's sort of the leader, commander of all the other officials, right? Um, and so it's associated with joy. Uh, it governs that we call the Shen, which is loosely translated to mind, but it's bigger than that. It's sort of what we in Western culture think of as emotions or depression, anxiety, if you're talking about disharmony. Um, and it also could be related to dreams, right? So that's interesting too, or sleep. Um, so people with insomnia may have issues with this um, or disharmony in this element. Uh, and it's associated with bitter taste, the color red, of course, and laughter. And the heart's sister, Meridian, is the small intestine. So that's sort of its buddy um, when you're talking about yin and yang. And the small intestine is all about receiving and transforming, separating, sorting. Uh, so it's kind of what gives the heart information. It sorts all the information. So sometimes when you meet with somebody, and they're teaching you something and you're like, oh, I can't follow that at all. That might be because there's something uh, disharmonious with their small intestine. They don't have that clarity of mind to feed to the heart the information to be able to give to the world um, in a clear way. And then the other two are the pericardium, which protects the heart. Uh, and it does that in Western medicine too. It's sort of that shield to the heart and encapsulates it. Uh, but in a broader sense, 
and Eastern medicine. It also uh, relates to our relationships with other people, our vulnerability, right? And, and sexual secretions, of course, because that kind of goes along with it. Uh, and also has a role in circulation. The pericardium is what protects the heart and creates a boundary. So when emotions that are hard for us or shock kind of come into our body, um, it will create sort of a guard to guard the heart because in Eastern medicine, the worst thing that could happen is if those things hit the heart. When the heart becomes diseased, um, that can lead to cardiovascular problems. Um, and other sort of mental health issues of what we call, you know, depression, anxiety, mania. Um, and then the triple heater, which like I said, is sort of unique to, uh, oh, sorry, let me go back, is sort of unique to Eastern medicine, um, is kind of like the hypothalamus of the body or, you know, the thyroid, I guess. It maintains temperature control movement of fluids um, in a bigger sense or emotional spiritual sense, it creates boundaries. It's kind of the social hostess. Uh, it gives your warmth out to other people in an appropriate way, but also leaving some for yourself, right? So I am going to stop sharing my screen because we are gonna do some acupressure. So the two points I have to offer you today um, is pericardium six and triple heater five. And these ones are really easy to find, which is great. So if you go to your hand and you're gonna go down your wrist, right? If you place four, three fingers from your wrist, that's about the distance from your wrist to the point. The way I find it is I just sort of go in the middle and I track it down and I find it just right here. Sometimes there's like a little depression, sometimes not. Sometimes it's tender, sometimes it's not, that's okay. And PC6 is one of probably the most famous acupuncture points because it helps with so many things. If you look up any clinical study, um, you're going to see PC6 probably as one of the points that they used uh, in their point prescription, you know, whether it be hypertension or anxiety, depression, um, things that also can help with is hyperthyroidism, anything palpitations related. Yep, it can help with nausea, dizziness, insomnia, seizures even. So it's just a great all, all around point. And it really helps on a spiritual, uh, mental level, the patient get in touch with what they want out of life. It helps them get in touch with themselves, uh, which, which is great because sometimes people come to you and they say they feel sort of lost. Uh, and this is a great point to kind of come back to. The other point is triple energizer five. And the good thing about that is it is directly across on the other side from PC6. So if you were to take your fingers again and put them up towards your wrist, and that's about the same distance, right? You're gonna fall into this little depression between these two bones here, the radius and the ulna, and it should be directly across from PC6 because they're a pair. We call them inner and outer frontier gates. Right. So, and the nice thing about this acupressure exercise is that you can rub them both at the same time. There isn't many acupressure points that you can do simultaneously, and these ones you can. And they go together very well in practice. We often needle them together. So while you're rubbing it, think about how this is really good for, on a physical level, febrile diseases. Um, it's really good for shoulder pain, neck stiffness, headaches. Uh, it's just all over a great point for that. And they work together because just as PC6 helps you relate to yourself, Triple Energizer 5 helps you relate to the world, right? But with boundaries. So you're keeping enough for yourself, but you're also keeping your heart open. So it can be a great point combination for people who are heartbroken. You know, maybe they're having relationship problems or maybe they're having problems just with their relationship with themselves. Um, so these are some great points. And while we rub on them, I'm going to do a little meditation so you can get into a position that you feel really comfortable, whether that's laying down or sitting, whatever feels good. If you want to turn off your camera and do it, feel free to do that. Um, and it's just a little meditation about the sun and healing with that intention. So take a deep breath in and breathe out. 
And you can do that maybe two or three times just to get yourself in a really good centered place. Close your eyes if that feels comfortable. And take some time to go in within yourself to settle your body, mind, and heart. Feel free to use whatever method works best for you. If it's focusing on your breathing or stretching your body mindfully or using a sound word image or a mantra to get yourself centered, just take your time allowing yourself to be more at ease. And as you allow yourself to be relaxed and as comfortable as you can, let your body feel supported by the ground underneath you. Slowly begin to see or feel yourself lying in a grassy meadow with the sun shining its golden rays gently upon you. Let yourself soak in these warm rays, taking in the healing power and life-giving energy of the sunshine. This magnificent ball of light has been a sustaining source of energy for millions of years and will be an energy source for millions of years to come. This ancient sun is the same sun which shined down upon the dinosaurs, upon the Egyptians when they were building the pyramids, and it shines upon the earth and all the planets in our solar system and will continue to do so. As the sun's rays gently touch your skin, allow yourself to feel the warmth and energy flow slowly through your body, pulsing through your bones, sending healing light to your organs, following to your tissues, recharging every system, and now settling into your innermost being, your heart center. Sense your heart center glowing with this radiant energy. If you wish, give it a color. Take a few moments to allow this warm and healing energy to reach your innermost being, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. As this healing energy grows and expands, allow yourself to see, feel, and sense this energy surrounding your being, growing and growing. Allow this energy to further fill this room, this building, surrounding this town, spreading throughout our state, to our country, out into the world, and finally throughout the universe, reaching and touching and blessing all. You may share this healing energy and power with anyone you're aware of right now. Mentally ask them if they're willing to receive this healing energy. If they are, send the source of healing energy to them. Give them the time they need to take in this energy and make it the theirs in their own heart center. Now take your attention back to your own heart center. Find a safe place within you to keep this healing and powerful energy, a place to keep it protected and within your reach. Give yourself permission to get in touch with this energy whatever you wish. With the warmth of this energy in your being, begin stretching, wiggling, and moving slowly opening your eyes, feeling alive, refreshed, alert, and completely healthy. Great. So if you guys want to come back when you're ready, I hope that brought some sunshine and light. Uh, and now we're going to pivot a little bit to doing some Qigong. So I am going to stand up. You can do it sitting down. That's totally fine. And this is Qigong for the, the fire element or for the summer. So this is a really good one to do in the summer. Let me just make sure that I'm back enough that you can see. Okay, great. So this one, you're going to start with bending your knees, legs about hip width apart. Have a little bit of a bend. And your hands are going to go in front of you. But we're going to start up right, with our hands up, which we don't usually do, but in this one we do. So you're going to start with your hands up, you're going to stand up, then you're going to make little bird beaks, turn your bird beaks towards you, 
towards your chest and you're going to crouch in almost like a little bird in an egg, making yourself really small, knees bent, head down. And then as your knees come up, as you come up, you spread out your hands, palms forward, fingers spread, make sure that pericardium channel is exposed. It helps if you can smile when you do this. It will bring that joy emotion. Even if it's a fake smile, that's okay. Let me turn this off so there's no glare. So then again, you're gonna take a deep breath in. Make yourself small, small. And then come up, breathe out. Make your hands big, open, wide. This is great to open your chest. This is great if you have any cardiovascular issues. You can do this sitting down just as well as standing up. Again, breathe in, make yourself small, then breathe out, smile, hands in front, fingers spread. And then we'll just do it maybe two more times. Bird begin, bend over, breathe out, try to do it with your own breathing. Whatever feels natural for you, the rhythm of your own breath. Great, and then when you're done with that, just wiggle it off. After Qigong, you gotta get all the, anything that's contaminated off, like you have something sticky, So just make sure you wiggle it off. And it's always good to do a little bit of a closing down. So palms in front, we've done this one before. Knees bent, arms go up, and you're just pushing down. And your knees bend as you come up. Just push everything you no longer serving you. It's contaminated, you don't need it anymore. Just push it into the earth. The earth can handle it. And you just do that a couple of times. And it's always good after you do some Qigong to sit with it and see what it feels like in your body. Anything is okay. Nothing is okay. The idea is just to notice without judgment, without figuring out why. And great. Well, thank you all so much for having me again. It's always great to talk to you guys about COVID and do something more nature related. So I appreciate the invite. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, everyone. Does anybody have any last questions for Ashley or for Jennifer? I just want to say thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you both so much for joining us. Everyone have a lovely weekend. Stay hydrated. <laughs>